There we go. Um, good morning, and thank you all for joining us. Um, you know, test optional admissions is, is one of this year's hottest topics in the college admissions world. Um, I enjoyed in lis listening in uh, to Matt LaVera's uh, presentation yesterday. I, I think he's fundamentally wrong about many of the arguments in that cherry picked the data, um, but we'll have an opportunity perhaps down the road to, to debate that and to, to give you a chance to hear both views simultaneously. But I really appreciate um, the, the Matt, Kevin and others, uh, the Association of, of Test Prep Professionals for setting this up, um, giving an opportunity to present on this. I'm gonna have a bunch of slides to run through. There'll be plenty of time for your questions and comments. Um, certainly eager to hear different points of view. Um, and with that, I'm about to get started. Kevin, do you have more people waiting to get in or are we ready to go? We are ready to go. Okay, thank you. So I'm Schaefer, I'm currently the executive director of Fair Tests, the National Center for Fair and Open Testing, though lots of people know us by our website, fairtest.org, which among other things, hosts the definitive list of test optional and test blind colleges and universities in the US. I've also written a bunch of, of publications for fair test and for commercial publishers. And probably the most relevant to this conversation is a, is a long paper available for free on our website called Test Scores Do Not Equal Merit, Enhancing Equity and Excellence in College Admissions by De-Emphasizing ACT and SAT Results. And most recently, I was a contributor to the Teacher College Press book published right as the pandemic was taking off called The Scandal of Standardized Tests, Why We Need to Drop the ACT and SAT. Um, in my own background um, is the, I came to this issue accidentally by knowing the person who started Fair Test, who asked me to help out because he knew of my previous experience working at the Education Research Center at MIT, where I had been both an undergraduate and graduate student with, a, and I worked there with a, a previous generation of test critics um, and uh, learned much more from working with Fair Test over the years and have been leading its test optional program uh, for the last couple decades. So today's topic, as you've seen, is why SAT, ACT optional policies are here to stay. Um, and I hope to persuade you with data um, that that is the case, that no matter what happens in the next couple of years with the resurgence of COVID and, and test score waivers, waivers, that for the majority of applicants who are just starting high school now, the classes of you know, 26, 27, 28 even, test optional admissions will be the new normal. Uh, and it will be the practice of more than half the colleges uh, and universities in the US. So um, the past it is indeed prelude. Um, and I wanted to start to about where we were at pre-pandemic um, because the test optional movement was accelerating very rapidly before its perverse boost from um, the COVID-induced shutdowns of testing. In, in the year, Prior to the pandemic, 51 more schools went test optional. That was the most ever by far. In the five years since the last comprehensive overhaul of the, uh, the SAT, I have files called New SAT, New New SAT, New 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 SAT. But since the last SAT overhaul in, in 2015, uh, 175 institutions had dropped test score requirements. Um, and that had become a, a pervasive movement, particularly among top tier liberal arts colleges, about 60% of the top 100 schools, and, and I'm referencing US news rankings only as a, a, as a way to uh, segregate schools into, into categories. We think the rankings, you know, the specific specificity of the rank rankings is a classic example of garbage in and garbage out. But to the extent the public pays attention to them, um, more than half of their top tier were top were test optional. In the liberal arts world, 
and there had been a sharp increase in, in national and regional universities, including public campuses like the University of Indiana pre-pandemic. So where we are on, on March 10th, 2020, and I, I'm using that as the benchmark because it was, it was the weekend before the pandemic blossom full in the United States. Um, 1,070 accredited four-year institutions were test optional, some call themselves test flexible. One was test blind. Um, there are 2,330 four-year schools in the US. So that was in the mid 40% of schools were test optional pre-pandemic. Um, among those, about 360 were ranked in the top tier by US News in one category or another. As I said, more than half of, of top 100 national liberal arts colleges and about a quarter of national universities were traditional. The trends we were seeing was geographic. The test optional movement began in the Northeast. The first test optional school was Bowdoin College in Maine. It went test optional quietly in 1969. Uh, the modern test optional movement was kicked off by Bates also in Maine in 1985. It happened to be the same year Fair Test was created, but there was no, no connection whatsoever. Um, and by the time we got to 2020, in the Northeast, it's sort of a, a geographic spread, South and West, um, all the, the, the colleges in the Northeastern part of all the states of the Northeastern part of the U.S. had more than half their schools test optional. Um, and we're seeing further that trend expanding geographically again, south and west to uh, District of Columbia, Maryland, Pennsylvania, and Virginia. And we're just starting to see the beginnings of outposts for test optional admissions in the south, always historically the most test friendly part of the US, the Midwest and the West. What was accelerating this, uh, e this trend pre-pandemic? Um, were a number of excellent publications. Most importantly, I think, was a book uh, put out called Crossing the Finish Line that studied with reams of data um, the predictors of completing college in America's public universities and reached these in the two authors were the, uh, the president of Har Harvard, the former president of Princeton, um, and the president, I believe, this, of the Spencer Foundation. Um, and they found that... Uh, based on the data, which is produced in the book, high school grades are a far better predictor, predictor of college graduation than test scores. Heavy reliance on test scores can have a negative impact on diversity. And that the strong predictive power of high school GPA holds even when we know nothing about the quality of the high school the applicant attended. Now, these are the arguments that, that test optional proponents had been making for the past two decades, as the movement sl slowly grew, um, and including you know, name brand places like Smith and Mount Holyoke, uh, Wake Forest and Brandeis. But um, to see this all compiled in one book um, had a significant impact, in part because of who the authors. The other major publication um, was, done on, was published under the auspices of NACAC, the National Association of College Admissions Counselors. And they looked at data from 28 institutions with test optional policies. Um, more than 950,000 applicants, nearly a million applicants. And they found generally across the board that schools that went test optional saw a near universal increase in applicants, a boost in the number of underrepresented minorities Pell grantees, first gen students, et cetera. And that tracking those applicants over time, they had graduation rates as good or better than students who applied with ACT, SAT scores. So non submitters did essentially as well as submitters over the undergraduate experience academically. And that report is still available on NACACnet.org. Uh, you can look up it most easily if you want to search for it uh, by using Googling the name Bill Hiss, who was one of the co-authors. So just look at hissreportnacacnet.org and you will find it. Other factors that were 
accelerating the desktop still movement pre-pandemic, ongoing ACT, SAT cheating scandals um, in which tests had to be canceled in entire countries uh, like South Korea. Um, the individuals had their scores canceled, a uh, huge expose by uh, Reuters news service um, and the, uh, a problem that continues apparently to this day that at least with the SAT, which is still given in pencil and paper form overseas, um, there is a real security problem with making sure that test forms are not seen in advance of administration. ACT addresses the problem by only administering tests overseas on computer, uh, at computer centers. Um, the year before the pandemic in, in uh, uh, in 2019, the huge Varsity Blues scandal, which is still playing out. There was a, a, a guy, uh, a father sentenced just this past week for paying to, uh, to boost his kids' scores by um, bribing tutors. Uh, but that, that, again, reinforced the notion that some of these scores are just not real and, and undermine their credibility. Your industries, uh, firms' claims of large store gains. I still uh, refer reporters to a, to a guy named Anthony Green, who has a website, who claimed he was charging $1,000 an hour and guaranteed a couple hundred point increase. Thanks for that. Um, the, you know, that led to many people believing, I think correctly, that families with means could buy the the equivalent of test prep steroids for their children, giving kids who already had every opportunity in life another huge leg up in the admissions process by improving their test scores, not necessarily making them best, better students. And perversely, a, the attack, the ongoing attack assault on affirmative action with lawsuits uh, by a, a, a group with, who, all, whose name is false in all of its parts, Students for Fair Admissions. It's, it's one right-wing crank um, who is not for fair admissions. He doesn't care about things like, like legacies or athlete admissions. He only cares about uh, admissions policies that he might advantage people of color, particularly African-American um, and, and Latino. In any case, their, test score, their assaults make the implicit argument that the only way to choose uh, to admit students would be based on test scores. And that's had in the larger public, uh, I think a, a, a negative impact and one that has led to further criticism of, of test scores. There have been also reports done by, by individuals who are not affiliated with the test optional movement in any way that have looked at what would happen if you did admissions only on the basis of test scores um, and that you would end up bleaching and riching um, your admissions pool, as you might expect. And the most important accelerant at work pre-pandemic was the University of California's review that started in 2018 of admissions test requirements um, and lawsuits around that. And as we'll see in a moment, that, that has played out um, in creating a situation in which uh, California publics are all test blind um, all the publics on the West Coast are now test optional or test blind. Um, and so what had been a, a regional movement is now a strong national movement. And the most important factor of all in increasing the size of the test optional movement was the success of peer institutions that went test optional. I recall talking uh, several years ago with, with Ann McLaughlin, who just retired um, as the admissions director at Holy Cross, and asking her, why Worcester, Massachusetts, of all places, had become a, a, a test optional hotspot with about a dozen schools, Assumption, Clark, Worcester Polytechnic, uh, and others all going test optional. And she said, we have lunch together. And what she meant is that admissions directors talk to one another and that one of them, when one of them has an innovation that works, um, it makes it easier for others in the same geographic area to pick it up and apply it. And so you see admissions hot, test optional hotspots like Worcester, like Providence, Rhode Island, like Philadelphia, 
Pennsylvania, like Baltimore, Maryland, where like other innovations, it's spread by word of mouth and become um, the new normal. After all, that's all background and brings us to uh, the second week in March in, in 2020, where everybody's life changed, the country changed, and testing changed. Um, the initial impacts of, of, the, the, of the COVID-19 pandemic, as you know, most public classrooms shut. School-based testing sites for uh, school day SAT and in school ACT, which had become a, a, a major moneymaker for the testing companies and a way to to build volume by registering kids wholesale rather than uh, selling to parents retail. Schools were closed, so the tests were closed. Literally, we believe about 900,000 SATs were canceled um, in the spring of 2021, uh, 2020. Um, the uh, colleges shifted to remote learning at colleges and high schools. And it, this left kids, their families, their counselors, in limbo about how admissions would operate um, in the, the 2020 cycle and beyond. Very quickly, in about a two month period, higher education reacted to these realities um, very firmly. About 650 more schools on top of the 1,070 that were already test optional announced that they would not require test scores for fall 2020, and in most cases, fall 2021. Lots of them uh, launched two or three year pilot programs, hundreds of them permanently eliminated scores. Many had, I mean, several have said this case, Western Reserve, Tufts, that they were in the process of analyzing test optional admissions. And the, the pandemic was a, a catalyst um, that moved them to taking it off the back burner and implementing it immediately. So by the time you, you got to the, the start of the, the, the fall 2021 admission cycle in August of 2020, all the nation's most private university, most selective private universities had waived test score requirements. All the, the Ivy Plus group, uh, Stanford, USC, et cetera, Every major public university system in the country, except for the Florida university system, and I, I say that with despair since I'm a Florida resident, um, suspended test scores uh, for, the fall, for at least fall 2021. And the process in California that had been already underway to reevaluate the role of test scores culminated with the Board of Regents for suspending test score requirements for 20. 21, and then in the face of a lawsuit, which we were involved in, uh, deciding that they were going to eliminate test ACT, SAT scores permanently, and ultimately went test blind for 21, 22, uh, and for the next several years as well. And to try to, this was hugely disruptive. People never had an in which, you know, the Harvards of the Harvards and the Stanfords of the world and, and everybody else were were test optional. Um, NACAC, National Association for College Admissions Counseling, organized a sign-on statement, which ultimately 550 admissions leaders signed, pledging that they will not penalize applicants who do not submit test scores. And that they they had a nice title for that, which is test optional means optional. And I think that in most cases. That has been the practice. So where are we at now? You know, it's, it's an incredible history of, of you know, barely 16 months. Uh, as of this week, for fall, for fall 2021, some, a few schools are still have their admissions process open for fall 2021. 1,700, about three quarters of all four-year schools are test optional or test blind for fall 2021 applicants. Those are kids who just graduated from high school earlier this summer or late last spring. But it, most interesting from our perspective is, is that already before the start of the next admission cycle, 1,590 plus schools 
uh, more than two thirds of all schools have announced that they will be test optional, test flexible or test blind for fall 2022 and in many cases beyond. And whereas for the fall 2021, 70 schools were test blind, which means they would not consider test scores even if they were submitted. There are now more than 75 test blind and we accept, expect to see more announcements of both test blind and test optional policies in the next 10 days as the new Common App is unveiled and schools make public their testing requirements for fall 2022. So for, for, for your, your kid, the kids you work with who are rising seniors, um, nearly all the top 100 national liberal arts colleges remain um, test optional. The only one I know is not test optional is the US Naval Academy. Um, and most top 200 national universities uh, are also test optional. The outliers there are the University of Florida system, again, the, the University of Georgia system, which includes UGA and Georgia Tech, reverted and is restored its test score requirement over the objections of admissions leaders, but it's, it's a politically important, uh, politically appointed board that makes those decisions. But even in the, the test crazy South, um, the University of South Carolina, Clemson, University of North Carolina, University of Alabama at Tuscaloosa, University of Tennessee at Knoxville, University of Kentucky, all of those places are remaining test optional for at least another year. And some for many years, the University of Oklahoma is gonna be test optional for years. So if, if you know, you look at the full list on our website, fairtest.org, but you know, name, name a name brand institution and it is most likely test optional. I mean, what's not on that list? The, the uh, service academies, well, that's a public institution. Georgetown, may, hard to tell what, what Georgetown's policy is, but it looks to me like they're requiring tests next year. I think, you know, Georgetown has been a place that is probably deeply upset that the subject tests and the right SAT writing test were eliminated as well. Uh, but everybody else in, in the, the, the highly selective private world um, is test optional. Uh, and the, the greatest change has been in the public world. A uh, number of systems are test blind. Uh, University of Colorado, some, uh, uh, the CUNY system in New York, um, the Washington State University system will not consider test scores if, if submitted. And in terms of normal test optional policies, all the big 10, um, the, most of the, the, the Southeastern Conference, all the Pac-10, if you think in terms of, of sports, you know, the, the, the largest public university systems in the country, New York, Texas, um, test optional, um, and California, uh, both the U University of California nine campuses and the 27 uh, Cal State campuses are test blind for fall 2022. In fact, they will be test blind through at least fall 2024. So it's, you know, the reality that, that your kids are facing, the, the families you're working with, is a universe in which most institutions will be test optional. Why? I mean, what's going on here? I mean, and I, I said to, to Kevin when we were talking beforehand, I, kids are slow to respond to this opportunity. All they've known in the past and their parents have known in the past was a world in which tests were a hurdle and expectations were pretty low for the percentage of kids who would apply test optional. Today, the University of Indiana at Bloomington uh, released its statistics on admits. It expected about 20% of students to apply test optional, 40%. Um, these are kids who are matriculating this fall. 40% were admitted with uh, without test scores. So you kids see it, increasingly see it as um, a way to save time and money um, in a time of, in a period of, of awful economic and psychological disruption for many families. Many kids 
embrace the fact that they will be judged as more than a score. Um, they've grown up in the no child left behind era in which they were tested to death. Independent studies show that a typical student who graduates from an urban high school in the United States has taken 112 standardized tests before she receives her diploma. You know, enough is enough. Um, and a, a growing belief um, that both test scores obscure their real talents. And in the wake of, of George Floyd and the other awful events of the past year, in addition to the pandemic, that those tests may be racist. Um, and because so many schools have gone test optional, they're no longer viewed as lesser. They're not inferior. And finally, because the pandemic and the variants and, and the Delta and other uh, problems in, in the healthcare system, there is no test worth risking a human being's life to take. And lots of kids understand that, particularly those who've seen their peers and their family members uh, awfully affected by the pandemic. On the other side, um, from the admissions office perspective, as, as I mentioned, we put that we fair test contributed to an, an, an yet another book, uh, which was somewhat lost in, in the pandemic, uh, published by Teachers College Press, which is another fact statistics filled book called The Scandal of Standardized Tests, Why We Need to Drop the SAT. Um, the Harvard Education School has been pushing a, a report and updates called Turning the Tide, which argue that colleges need to look at, at much more than simple academics and that they need to get away from a strong emphasis on test scores. The, the data from fall 2021 admission cycle uh, decisions has been far beyond the expectations of test optional proponents. The University of California system reported its admissions numbers earlier this year, and there was increases in diversity of every sort you can imagine. Race, family income, Pell recipients, first generation applicants. Uh, test optional admissions did open the doors. Not, not alone, other, you know, there are other factors involved in the admissions process than test scores, but eliminating test scores was a major factor. Other schools have, have thought scores in the context of, of what's going on in this country in terms of it, its review of it of present and past racial policies um, and, and seeing test scores as a possible contributor to those unfair barriers. And you know, again, most important of all is data that individual institutions do their own research on uh, the role of test scores. And most of them have decided, um, just like crossing the finish line discovered, that test scores aren't all that useful. Um, and of course, looking forward uh, toward this, this fall, taking tests may not be safe. So again, just to summarize, the, the major results of test optional policies, both historically and in the 2021 admission cycle. Schools in general get more applicants, often many, many more applicants, particularly name brand schools. They get an, ap an academically stronger applicant pool in terms of high school grade point average, class rank, course rigor, number of AP exams, et cetera, et cetera. And they get more diversity of all sorts, race, first gen, low income, second language, geography, academic interests, learning differences. It broadens the pool and gives them more opportunity to, to build a class um, that is representative of the types of kids they want to have in that institution. And of course, ongoing research at schools that have been test optional for a while find no significant differences in undergraduate success between submitters and non-submitters. So looking forward, I, I wanna get to your questions and quickly and um, looking forward, what's, what's gonna happen? Well, we've already seen that for the, you know, the class of 2023 and 24, more than half of the colleges and universities in the country will be test optional. The, the test waivers catalyzed by the pandemic, temporary policies, create natural experiments 
and uh, institutional researchers, enrollment directors at, at colleges are spending a lot of time analyzing what happens with the kids who uh, apply without test scores compared to those who do. We are confident based on past experience that they will find no harm and many gains from a test optional policy. Typically, and, and there's experience going all the way back to Bates in, in the mid 1980s, which first dipped its toes in the water with a test optional pilot program. That pilot programs with uh, waiving test scores almost always become permanent because admissions officers make that process work. I mean, it's not easy, particularly this past year, for schools to, to jump from a, a, a a historic pattern of using test scores and having formulas that weigh test scores to ignoring test scores. But that's what places like Berkeley and UCLA had to do. And I've spoken to the admissions directors at both of those places, and they both said, we made it work. Uh, not easy, but they now have systems in place um, that can do high quality, fair admissions without reliance on test scores. And then there's there's Market realities, um, many admissions offices operate in, in very competitive envir environments. Um, as you know, a number of colleges have gone out of business, lots of them, particularly with the pandemic or in, in economic trouble. The reality is when you see your competitors being test optional, you look at the demographic projections and you see a decline in the number of high school grads in each of the next, for over the next decade. Um, there are strong pragmatic reasons, putting aside the value of test optional, to not require test scores if that's what your competitors are doing. And of course, I keep coming back to this at the bottom of every screen, I think. The experience of the University of California, arguably the most prestigious public system in the world, um, and the Cal State University system, the largest, public system in the United States with test blind admissions is going to provide models for other large public systems. Um, and to the extent that test optional or test blind as their case is, is successful, uh, it's much more likely that other peer organizations, peer institutions will feel compelled to follow suit. So here's, here's, here's the future as fair test season. And uh, Kevin, destroy this slide afterwards because I don't want to be held to it. But I, I think we're right. We'll find out. Um, many more institutions extend test optional and test blind policies, in, in, including additional name brand schools and state systems. We already see uh, the first Ivy experimenting with test blind policies. Several of the schools at Cornell um, are test blind for the, uh, the next several years. So it's, it, it's beginning to trickle into that world. Um, studies will continue to show that students admitted without test scores succeed academically at roughly the same levels as those with who submitted test scores. Um, you know, the, 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 the pragmatic factors, um, appearance behavior, uh, you know, it, it was interesting watching you know, admit, admit the pandemic last spring, a year ago spring, that, you know, groups of schools announcing test optional, like within a 10, uh, within a one, one day period, all the Ivies announced almost at the same time, all of the little Ivies, uh, you know, the, the Middlebury's um, and, and Amherst and, and uh, uh, all announced in, in almost exactly the same time. It, it's, it's not an accident. They pay attention to their peers. So where that leads us, I think, at least in the midterm future, say the rest um, uh, of this decade, is the SAT and ACT don't disappear. It's not something Fairtest has ever explicitly called for, but they come, become a much less important factor in admissions. Um, and more like, you know, the subject tests were, um, or the SAT so-called writing tests were, e the vast majority of schools will be test optional. The unknowns are the hyper-selective schools, um, which can pretty much do whatever they want um, for the long run, even though we saw before the pandemic, um, institutions 
like the University of Chicago going test blind and places now like Berkeley and, and UCLA not ever again requiring the ACT, SAT. So hyper-selective schools could still require them. I think many small, particularly conservative religious schools uh, will require them. Uh, but for the vast majority of schools serving the overwhelming proportion of undergraduate applicants, test scores will no longer be required. And, and the final point here is, uh, is a hope and a slowly growing reality is that schools start to decouple test scores from financial aid, so-called merit aid decisions. Test scores don't equal merit as, as Fairtest wrote a long time ago. And the reality is for many applicants that getting scholarship money is more important than getting a seat in college. That if you're being offered a seat without the means to pay for it is meaningless. And if you're gonna link, you're gonna make admissions test optional, but link financial aid to test scores, the, the real world barrier is still there. So we're, we're, we work with a number of schools to eliminate those test score requirements, often in the form of matrices that for each additional point on the ACT or 40 points on the SAT, give you a thousand or two thousand dollars more a year, um, probably drive clients to many of you um, and, and end up awarding the bulk of that the money to kids from families uh, who are most likely to score high and who least need the financial aid. So we see that as the next frontier for the test optional movement is um, test blind um, or test, yeah, test optional or test blind for merit aid. Uh, so that, that's, I'm gonna wrap it up there um, and take your questions or comments. Um, there's much more background about this, uh, including free lists and whatnot available on our website at fairtest.org slash optional. Um, I see there's a bunch of hands up already, and I will turn it back to Kevin to, uh, to handle Great. the questions. Thanks so much, Bob. That was, uh, that was really helpful and, and super insightful about the history of test optional and where you think it's going. So we will uh, get to the questions right away. And uh, Matt, we have you first. Go ahead, buddy. Uh, Bob, that was a, a great presentation. Great deck. Um, I've never heard you speak before. So that was especially a nice treat for me. Um, you should come so to NACAC. I speak all the time. <laughs> We'll, yeah, I think I'd be kicked We'll do out. This, this again there in Seattle this fall. Yeah, um, I, I think you and I have a debate coming up, so I won't yep. uh, ask you too much, but um, I've always wanted to know, for a group called Fair Test, do you have an example of a test that you think is fair? We, well, Fair Test promotes better forms of assessment, usually performance-based assessment. So in New York State, where there's the New York Performance Assessment Consortium, uh, that uses portfolios, portfolios, and projects designed by teachers with common rubrics. Sure, to, but that's not a test. It's an assessment. Right. Um, Understood. Is, you prefer I mean, assessments, but do I you think, have any are, examples if, of fair tests? Question, a, a single multiple choice test used for high stakes? No. Any episodic experiment, anything that you could complete in- No, in but that, like, that, that's what's wrong with the concept, that- human ability is too broad and complicated to measure by filling in bubbles in a short period of time. I mean, that systems that use a multiple choice test as part of a assessment package, say the written portion of a driver licensing assessment, where there's a rules of the road test, which you're supposed to pass in addition to a performance assessment, a driving test, plus there's ongoing assessment, which is to get your your license pulled for uh, if for for failure to uh, obey the law frequently. Um, that is a, a more reasonable assessment system. No, I, I think the you know the, the the notion of reliance on one shot standardized tests, particularly those attached at, attached to significant con significant consequences is severely flawed. So you have issues with like the USMLE tests? Yes. Okay. 
In fact, we're, we're working with groups of medical students. There, there is a, um, a growing MCAT optional movement. Um, mm -hmm. the, it, we've only talked here about ACT, SAT. There's been tremendous progress over the last three years in graduate school admissions optional with GRE and GMAT optional. Yeah. And major STEM programs across the country have dropped their testing requirements. Yeah. And they get That's, better. That makes sense. We really don't want our doctors to be able to perform well under pressure. No, uh, that's not what, uh, if the, in an operating room, and I was a pre-med student, in an operating room, there isn't a standardized test. There is a performance assessment. And the notion that you can capture all that complexity with multiple choice questions. May I, I, I have a, one of my brother-in-law is a, a, a doctor. He's an endocrinologist. He has to take every 10 years a, uh, a relicensing test. And what he does is study for the test for a year to pass the test. He says it has absolutely nothing to do with his practice of medicine. It's a game and it's a game that favors strong test takers like you and me, but doesn't necessarily mean they'd be good at, at, the, at the profession. I believe I could pass the golf pro licensing exam with a week of study. I could not hit a golf ball straight, let alone teach anybody to do it. It doesn't measure what you need to measure. Yeah, that's fair enough. Thank you. All right, other questions? Susan? Hi, Bob, thanks so much for your time today. Um, my question is, if we take SAT, ACT scores out of the college admissions process in order to gain equity to get more access, I'm wondering, are we left with a basket of information that is in fact more fair? You know, cause I'm looking at grade inflation, availability of AP mm -hmm. classes in high schools, availability of extracurricular activities and the money to do them, essay coaching, writing, and then the college consulting to put all of that into a package I guess I'm not sure how removing the one standardized measure helps us get to where fair test is looking to go. Well, you're correct that testing is not the only unfair barrier to access in the admissions process. Everything else that you cite matters. Um, as an organization focused on assessment, this is one, one of the major barriers we were able to help um, eliminate. The, I mean, it's, it's like there's an existence proof. This isn't even a debatable topic. There have been schools that have been test optional for 50 years. There's 50 years of data. You can make, Bates has published study after study showing what happened there. The kids are as good academically. I mean, you know, Bates is still you know, a highly selective liberal arts school that ranks well and whatever the ranksters make, they make those decisions based on. And it has somewhat diversified its student body. So it's a win-win uh, for them. You don't need test scores to make those kinds of decisions well. I mean, the University of Chicago, I think it is, a, is the right kind of model. In addition to eliminating their test score requirement a couple of years before the pandemic, they also significantly boosted their money for recruitment, for financial aid, um, so that they could help take down some of all those barriers, and and, and you know it's it's a miss, it's it's a fault. It's we are we do not believe that that is the only problem. Second thing I wanted to say, and I said this uh, to Matt's uh, presentation yesterday, there is greater inflation. It's real, and there's test score inflation, and that's even realer. Um, and I looked at the data after that. You know, the number of kids scoring uh, 1,400 above on the SAT has gone up like nine times the, uh, in the last uh, 20 years. There, it, it's good, good work by you people. I mean, it, it, we have lots of friends in the test prep industry, which we know works. Um, the, you know, I, I, can, I, I put up the, the citation for it. It's a study done by Compass Prep, a, a test prep company, um, that, you know, kids with means are boosting their test scores significantly by working with people like you. 
tap with you know with with competent test prep professionals. I'm sure that I'm sure everyone's happy about that because uh, I don't really know anyone that <clears throat> that does this you know to not help the kids succeed. Um, well, you know, yeah, I don't I don't think there's a, we we haven't seen. Matt said, "Even correlation is not cause causation. We don't know specifically if it's because uh, of test prep, but it's certainly that would be a good assumption." Bob, I have one um, that relates to the the merit aid piece. So that's the to me that's sort of the fatal flaw right now because um, the the people for whom test optional is purported to help um, could have actually been hindered. I guess in this, in the you know last year, because uh, they didn't submit test scores and they may have forfeited merit aid. Is there, is that a rational inference for me to make that that um, you know those people may have actually been disadvantaged by not submitting scores, or is it? I, I think at some places, I mean, we pushed hard, and, and many schools did listen to suspend test score merit aid. And I, I always put merit in air, air quotes because test scores aren't merit. You know, test taking uh, skill aid um, was suspended in lots of institutions. We need to make that permanent. But but you're right that it, that's uh, it remains a significant hurdle in the system. Of when I mean I, I I've done panels with you know the admissions directors at at University of Alabama, and they talk about oh we know we're opening door blah blah. And I show them from their state website what their their aid formula is, and it's it, it's it's a straightforward matrix. You know, you boost your ACT score by three points with a, a 3.8 GPA and you get $6,000 more a year. So, I mean, it's, it's a great investment to spend a you know, couple thousand bucks on a test prep tutor to make $20,000 in additional aid over a four year period. Yeah, that's a good point. That's a good point. Uh, do you think that uh, colleges are moving in that direction to be? Yes, they are. They are moving in that direction. We have not been able to get, a, we've been trying to, Akil Bellow uh, on our staff, has been trying to pull together um, a, a database of merit policies. And it turns out to be much harder than you think because many institutions have multiple scholarship programs, each with a different set of criterion. Sometimes as a condition of the endowment funds which fund it, that you know, there are test score requirements, there are GPA requirements, there are you know, e e geographic requirements, et cetera. So we, have, we don't have a good count um, on, on how many schools do it, but it's something we're watching. We, we did uh, in, uh, at the NACAC National Conference in Salt Lake City, it would have been two years before the pandemic, so uh, 18, uh, the, uh, we did a panel specifically on merit aid. And uh, Andy Palumbo, who's a uh, associate vice president at Worcester Polytech, has been a leader in this. He said it took him two years to figure out all the places where test scores were built into their system uh, for, for financial aid. And they then went test optional. And this year, they went test blind. Got it. Thanks for that. Um, that's super helpful. Uh, Megan, you had a question? Uh, yes, hi. Uh I've, I've been looking into a question for, for maybe the past year or so that has seemed sort of foundational to, to this discussion, but it's been really hard for me to gather information on. Um, and so I've been kind of wondering what, what's happening with the data, the package of data that an admissions department receives from an individual student, right? Like, um, are colleges, are they beefing up spending on staffing um, to process a more robust package of data on each student? In other words, are colleges actually putting in the work, investing the money in processing a more holistic picture of student data? Or are there indicators within that package that have become, you know, the new ACT? Is it, okay, we're just going to sort by GPA initially, just like sorting by ACT or SAT was the old way. So in other words, really wondering uh, if data exists about what, what's going on within admissions departments um, that are test optional, which, which pieces of that data are the key indicators and if they are indeed increasing spending. 
if anybody knows that? Um, I think the, the simple answer is nobody knows. Um, that those processes are often incredibly secretive and or complicated. Um, if you follow the lawsuits against Harvard and, and uh, University of North Carolina and others, you know, the, the information that's come out in discovery there, it doesn't clarify how these processes work. I would say co many colleges say they have been beefing up those systems. Um, I don't think there's any way for us to know most generally schools say, school, many schools have a system where they would create two indexes, in, indices for each applicant an academic and a non-academic in, index. And the academic index in the past would be a formula that included uh, uh, grades, rigor and test scores. And now they would create a new academic index without test scores um, and use it that in that way in a formula. But it, it's, it's, it's very difficult. I mean, I recall I was flying out to some conference somewhere a couple, number of years ago. I was sitting next to the admissions director at the University of South Carolina, uh, which is huge and now test optional, uh, at least for the next several years. But it, he, was, he was lamenting how hard it would be for him to do t test optional because his, his admissions office was under-resourced. And I think that's why you saw among the first schools going test optional where the small, highly selective liberal arts schools in the Northeast, often with significant financial endowments, who had the means to, to beef up and do it. It can be done, however. More than a decade ago, the, the guy who was admissions director at um, UC Berkeley, Robert Laird, wrote a, a wonderful piece um, a, about how he had prepared Berkeley to go test optional then as, as the the president of the University of California system threatened. Um, and, and that the way he had done it is he, he trained a bunch of other of people to, to, to read files, but he reached out and built a, a huge pool of readers from alumni, faculty, staff, folks in the area, so that there were a larger number of individuals trained on their reading rubric to make judgments without test scores. But it, it takes work. It takes human and financial resources to do it right. Interesting question, though. And yeah, definitely. <laughs> it, I think there'll definitely be some changes in the, the admissions side of things uh, in the coming years. It, it's a better question for admissions directors and en enrollment VPs. Yeah. Well, and if, you go to, if you go into NAPCAC, we're going to do a panel with uh, 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 the admissions VP from Kern Cornell and Marquette and Jacksonville, and we ask them those questions. Okay, uh, Aaron, question? Yeah, uh, thanks, thanks for your time today, Bob. Really, really appreciate it. Um, two, two questions, if I may sneak them in. Um, uh, first one, actually, on the, on the content of the test. I'm just wondering if, if your objection is largely to, you know, the high stakes nature and all of that, or like, do you think that the skills tested by the SAT or ACT are relevant or, or helpful to, to students going off to college? I'm just wondering to pick your brain on that. Uh, and then let me just get the second one in. Uh, growing, uh, growing AP movement, right? We've got a lot more students taking APs than ever before. And we've got a lot of colleges looking at those APs more than, than perhaps they have in the past. I'm wondering how, you know, your take on, on the value of those uh, pieces of this admission puzzle. Thank you so much. Okay, I mean, the, you know, the content that there is some link, there's some positive correlation between uh, SAT, ACT scores and first year grades and even graduation rates. Not as, not as strong as the correlation between high school grades and those outcomes. So yes, they do measure uh, some things of value. Um, they do not do measure it in a way that is fair across the board among students of all kinds of backgrounds. It is a, the tests are a better backward looking uh, measure than a forward looking measure. If your goal is to predict what students will be able to do in college, um, there are better measures available um, and fairer measures available. And that's, you know, again, the book Crossing the Finish Line makes this case with page upon page of statistics. Um, AP, fair test has always been called agnostic 
about advanced placement exams. I took advanced placement courses. My kid took advanced placement courses. They are a, a gateway rather than a gatekeeper um, and historically did not play a significant role in the admissions process back in the day when AP exams were largely taken by high school seniors because the scores from AP exams were not available until after admissions decisions were made. But as AP is getting pushed down into lower and lower grades and, and the college board, you know, don't have much to say about it, but they're not stupid economically. The, the AP program is now a, a larger revenue source than the SAT. Yes. College board. And, you know, they figured that that's where the bucks are and they have a monopoly, except for an international baccalaureate in that area. They have competitors. Uh, for in college admissions testing. And to, you know, to the extent that colleges are using them as an admissions test, again, there's no data on that either way. Um, there's, an, there's an equal access problem. You know, not all schools in the country even have AP courses. You know, I, I keep falling back on a, an old US Department of Education study, uh, which found that the single best predictor of undergraduate success was whether a student had taken the most rigorous courses available in her high school. So it's evaluating context. And that means a kid in Scarsdale or Beverly Hills taking 10 APs. And it means a kid in, in inner city Washington or uh, in Appalachia or in, in the Barrio and in, in, in El Paso uh, or on, on a Native American reservation taking the only science course with running water. Um, and it, it, you need to look at it in context and to, you know, to the extent that you're relying just on AP or IB, that's one of the other potential biases in the, pro in the, in the, in the system. No data that I've seen. Thank you. Thanks, Aaron. Thanks, Bob. So, I, I enjoy looking at everybody's bookshelves and seeing how many books that, that they have that I have and see the big test up there and everything else behind you. Looks it's like my office. Yeah, right. Um, what do you have? Oh, yeah, I can see yours too. So, so listen, uh, we're running up against the top of the hour and we, we need to begin another session. Does anyone have a just a quick question that will require a sort of a short answer, like a one minute or less type question? I'll jump in if it's okay. Um, thank you so much for sharing everything, Bob. It's really nice to know people out there really looking out for the students and all of this, you know. But my, my, my thought is, I don't know if I, the student, feel better about readers reading my information than I do about turning in a test score that's neutral. I just, I was just kind of love for, for your thoughts. I mean, readers always read um, the, the, the information. I mean, you know, Harvard or MIT could have always admitted a full class of 800s if that's how they were admitting and they're not. So, you know, without regard to debating whether test scores are or aren't neutral, there's a, oh, there is a very subjective part of the admissions process, no matter how you run it, because it's humans making decisions about other humans. Great. So uh, listen, folks, if you have questions for Bob that we didn't get to, please email me. And you can do that at teach at testprepprofessionals.com. And I will uh, afford them to Bob. Bob, thank you so much for making time. Thank you, Kevin. It was a pleasure having you. Hope to have you again. Glad to. Thanks, everybody. Wonderful. Have a great day, everyone. Bye.